Good morning, everyone. This is Vince Sprinkle. I'm the Senior Advisor for Energy Storage at PNNL and moderator of our Energy Storage at PNNL webinar series. So in this series, we're trying to uh, explore different aspects of PNNL's energy storage work and how that is impacting the way storage is deployed, um, especially on the grid. Uh, today, we're looking at the opportunities that we have in electric vehicle charging. And so, you know, there's the opportunities that are presented by, you know, these fleets of um, uh, energy storage systems that are distributed across, but there's also the challenge to that and then understanding the economics. And so we are joined today uh, by Christine Holland, who will be talking about some of the work that's gone on looking at economic analysis of fleet to grid applications. Uh, before I get started and do the introduction of Christine, I did want to kind of uh, make a couple notes, housekeeping notes. Please put your uh, questions as they come about into the chat window. And at the end, we will uh, aggregate those and, and try to address your, your questions at that point. So keep putting them in as they come through and we, we will uh, get to those. Secondly, uh, we typically do not uh, provide slides. It may, it may be possible depending up uh, on who our speaker is, uh, but there will be a recording of this uh, slide deck that you can easily get to. Uh, and again, we'll, we will post a link to that website. So without further ado, I will turn, get this turned over to Christine. So Christina uh, Holland is an economist at PNNL and she has more than 20 years of experience uh, in energy economics and spent the last 15 years specializing in the diffusion of energy and energy efficiency uh, technology adoption. She's analyzed high resolution light duty vehicle uh, deployments for PNNL's electric vehicles at scale project using both diffusion and discrete choice models and developed the economic analysis for multiple, multiple medium and heavy duty fleet electrification projects as well as stationary battery storage projects. Currently, she is working on equity applications in the EV space as part of the Go Deep initiative. So Christine, thank you for joining us today. Looking forward to your talk and I'll turn it over to you. Oh, thank you so much, Vince, for that nice introduction. Hello, everybody. Uh, let me just get, share my screen. Okay, so does everyone see the title page? That looks very good. You're okay, good to go. wonderful, wonderful. So again, thank you all. Um, today I'm speaking on behalf of a team. This was uh, definitely a team effort to analyze this uh, fleet vehicle to grid uh, economic analysis for V2G applications. Uh, Sid Sridhar was our program manager and program lead. Bon Wong was our lead engineer. And um, we also had Charlie Vartanian and Fish Viswanathan. They were also engineers who helped with some of the battery specification portions of the project. And I was the economist on the project. So um, in just a little bit more context here, so uh, our partnering utility was Snohomish PUD, Snowpud, and this was an extension of their microgrid work that they did uh, on their Arlington microgrid. So this is an expansion of that work. So Scott Gibson and Suzanne Fru were also very instrumental in helping us with this project. So moving on, uh, what is V2G? Uh, V2G vehicle to grid is the bi-directional flow of energy uh, between EVs and the grid. And we're looking at a fleet of medium and heavy duty EVs that could potentially act as a grid resource. And how would these, how would the vehicle to grid uh, technology help with grid applications? Well, uh, a big application would be helping with renewable energy integration 
as you know, many people, most states have renewable portfolio standards, which adds a lot of intermittency onto the grid. So um, a firm, firmer battery resource provisions could help stabilize this. Um, legal to grid could also help with resilience and other grid applications. And what EVs and EV supply equipment is already available? Well, light duty vehicles, there's Nissan Leaf and the Ford F-150 Lightning. From the medium and heavy duty uh, perspectives, there are E-Lion buses and Bluebird and Thomas Built have uh, heavy duty B2G capabilities already. And then from the charging and supply side infrastructure, there's Nuve, Rhombus, Fermata, and Mitsubishi. Um, Mitsubishi provided the charging for the Arlington, for Snowpud's Arlington microgrid, and Nissan provided the Leafs for the microgrid. And so uh, Mitsubishi and Nissan were also consultants on this project. There are V2G pilots in the US. Um, White Plains, uh, Massachusetts, and California, they all have bus projects, bus pilot projects right now. And from light duty perspectives, as I mentioned, Snohomish, uh, Washington, Rhode Island, and Roanoke also have light duty vehicle pilots. And just hot off the presses, Duke Energy is adding a pilot to explore how five Ford F-150 Lightnings could potentially act as a grid resource. So that's very new. And I know there are other, EPRI's working with other utilities and OEMs on uh, V2G and V2X. So from the stakeholder perspectives, there are several, there's several stakeholders and there's several priorities. So I'm just gonna go through some of the stakeholders. From the manufacturer perspective, they need to make a profit. So, uh, you know, we need to make sure that the V2G capability is profitable for the manufacturers and from a selling perspective that it doesn't degrade the battery. From the utility perspective, they need to make a profit after buying bulk purchases or using their supply side resources to fuel the batteries for the V2G applications. Then the fleet operator, um, you know, their primary responsibility is using the fleets for driving purposes, delivery purposes, getting the kids to school. So that's their primary purposes. So that can't be compromised in any way. So they need to make sure that, again, the batteries are operational it's meeting the uh, minimum state of charge for these other applications and that the cost of operating the batteries and the fleet for V2G isn't decremental for their profitability. <clears throat> Same goes for third-party aggregators. If they're gonna install the charging infrastructure and buy the V2G equipment, they need to make sure that they're making a profit at the end of the day. Um, from policymakers' perspective, they want to increase the adoption of EVs for their uh, transportation electrification policies uh, and for all of their grid reliability and resilience policies. And so we need to make sure that V2G doesn't, again, compromise their ability to do this. So can we use V2G to make this more profitable for owners of EVs to possibly enhance EV adoption. Some of the challenges and opportunities, well, this is so new that the, the business models have yet to be really developed for this. And what's gonna be the compensation for the fleets? And you know, this is gonna vary state by state, regulations for EVs, uh, both for operational, purposes and for EV adoption are gonna vary state by state. Um, you know, the challenge for fleet owners, again, is making sure that they can still use the fleets for their primary purpose. So they don't want to compromise the range of the vehicle for its primary purpose. 
nor compromise a um, battery lifespan or uh, you know, compromise the warranty of the battery. And then uh, that goes for ba battery degradation as well. Um, right now, V2G usage will uh, limit some of the warranties um, on these batteries. So we're working out that issue. And then uh, same goes for standards and incentives. Uh, from an incentive perspective, buying the bulk purchase or buying the bulk energy to operate and charge the batteries for V2G purposes is going to vary by region. So it's getting a better understanding of what the implications are, regional implications are for using V2G. V2G economic evaluation, here are some of the research questions from the power utility, from the utility perspective, what services may be most applicable or most uh, economically viable for V2G? What are the annual benefits to the utility from um, interacting in the wholesale market? From the fleet operator, you know, how is this going to impact battery life? And what are the what are the economic implications on battery life and life cycle costs? Then from policymakers, again, what are the factors that are going to amplify V2G benefit that they may be able to interact in the policy market or policy realm, excuse me. And here I have a, a simplified V2G market overview. Again, this is highly generalized, but this is kind of the basic steps of the V2G market. You're starting with the wholesale uh, bulk market at the top. And again, um, utilities may have their own resources to provide the energy to supply the fleet owners, or it may be a bilateral market. So, so again, the bulk or wholesale energy market is just a generalization. So they're selling this power to the utility who then sells the power to the fleet owner. So that's step two. Um, so they're selling this retail energy to the fleet owner who will then use that energy to charge the batteries for these additional V2G services. So they're purchasing power from the utility to operate the fleet, that they need to purchase additional power from the utility for those marginal V2G applications. Then they give it back to the utility. And then the, lastly, the utility will then use it for the grid service or the grid application that they're interested in. And expanding upon this, the grid services that the utility may be interested in, or is, it may just be um, a market application, pure energy arbitrage, buy low, sell high during uh, different periods of time, if that is available. Demand charge reduction. Again, this is from the utility perspective. So, they want to minimize any capacity charges or demand charges associated with buying at the bulk level. And then there's frequency regulation and spinning reserves. So these are different um, ancillary services that uh, utilities need to supply. And regarding the service of origin, again, this is an oversimplification, bulk power. Uh, this is presuming that they're buying all of their power on the wholesale market, they're not supplying it themselves. Um, you know, it could be a bilateral agreement also. So, in this application with Snowpud, they are getting most of their bulk power from Bonneville Power Association, and there are they receive demand charges from Bonneville Power that they're going to try and reduce. So they're going to try and uh, minimize the peak monthly peaks to minimize that associated demand charge. Also, they purchase frequency regulation from Bonneville Power. 
So we'll look at ways that um, they can use the V2G to minimize this. The green arrow down indicates that they are potentially receiving revenues from this. So Snowpad has a bilateral agreement with, Snow, uh, with uh, Seattle City Light for spinning reserves. So they sell power to Seattle City Light for um, spinning purposes, spinning reserve purposes. Uh, and they also could potentially receive revenues just through arbitrage. And then of course, all of the power is gonna filter between Snohomish PUD and uh, the potential fleet owner. So it's between the distribution utility and the fleet owner. The area of study for this research was uh, Bonneville Powers, uh, Snohomish PUD and Bonneville Power. However, we did also look at um, these grid applications in Cal the California ISO, MISO, which is Mid-Continent ISO, New York and New York ISO. So if we have time at the end, which I don't think we will, uh, I will bring up a spreadsheet to look at the marginal differences between these zones. So uh, one of the big differences with these other regions is that they have established markets. So it's actually a little bit easier to get the pricing data for these other regions. We, for this study, we looked at three different fleets. Uh, we looked at delivery vans, which is the Rivian delivery van, the uh, Ford F-150 Lightning all electric truck, and we looked at the all electric E-Lion school buses. Uh, so they have different uh, battery capacities and charging capacities. And then this last element for each of the fleets is when are the fleets available? And that data came from the National Renewable Energy Lab, NREAL's fleet data, uh, fleet DNA database. So that told us when we could actually use the kilowatt hours for the V2G applications. And then lastly, we assumed fleets of 50 for each for the delivery vans, maintenance trucks, and school buses. For the V2G economic evaluation, we had a two-step process. So the first step was the interaction between the utility and the bulk or wholesale market. And we used the fleet specs to optimize annual revenues for our four different applications. And then, um, so for each of the applications, we then had to constrain the uh, optimization based on the battery specifications, the uh, state of charge uh, limitations based on the primary use of the vehicle and the battery characteristics. And then again, the energy and, and battery balance for the fleets. Then the second step was the total cost analysis. And here we took into consideration the life cycle analysis and the operational costs for the fleet owner. Um, here we looked at the additional cycling of the battery and the implications for the battery life, as well as the marginal operational impacts of using the V2G for these additional um, V2G applications. A, a very high overview, we looked at the net present value from the utility perspective. And so this is just the buying and the selling of the power for the V2G applications. And then from the fleet owner perspective, we looked at the operational implications of using the battery for V2G. And then the, the big question here is, how should fleet owners be compensated for the V2G services? That's one of the uh, 
research questions that we're trying to identify today. So this is step one, and I am not going to do this slide justice. So this was part of the, um, uh, the battery optimization process. And uh, Bowen used the, our B-set tool, which is our battery optimization tool, to calculate or estimate the annual benefits for each of the four applications, the energy arbitrage, the frequency regulation, demand charge, and spinning reserve. So here he had to use the um, price of the bulk power purchase as well as the market or wholesale cost or revenues for each one of these services. And then he had to constrain the linear optimization according to the battery specifications and the, the power limits of the battery the balancing of the battery for uh, both to meet a particular state of charge as well as meeting the primary use for the batteries and uh, any sort of additional constraints for the frequency re regulation or spinning reserve demand charge, such as the ramping up, ramp down, or minimal amounts of times and all the other uh, grid requirements that go into these different services. And then step two, here's where we had to add in the operational costs of using the fleet for just V2G. So this is the marginal or additional battery usage for the V2G applications. And here in, uh, I'm just illustrating the difference between the base case, which is driving only the top line, and the bottom case, which is the uh, driving plus V2G applications. So in year one, in both applications, you're starting with the same fleet. And on the upper line, if you're just using the battery for driving, then the uh, fleet will retire, the batteries will retire, in year 13, and then you replace, the fleet, you replace the fleet in year 14. With the, in the second case, the V2G case with the additional cycling, this may result in battery degradation and earlier fleet replacement. And if you have to replace the fleet earlier, that means you have additional debt cost. Also, that's equity that you couldn't be investing elsewhere. So you have lost uh, return on your investment for those five years. I did not include the equity or, or actual capital cost of the fleet replacement because that would have happened regardless in year 14, but you are incurring additional loan debt and lost opportunity cost. What you are incurring over the entire, and also we're looking at a 15 year project horizon. And so then over that 15 years, you are getting any marginal operating costs associated with just the V2G usage. And some of the metrics we looked at uh, were net present value, as I mentioned, and this is just the present value of the cash flow and what you need to get uh, the desired return on your project. And this is based on uh, gross revenues, and that's the marginal revenues that the utility gets from buying and selling the, part, uh, the power for the V2G applications, minus the cost of the uh, V2G usage, and this is just uh, this is the cost associated with that early replacement cost or any bulk purchases associated with purchasing the power to fuel the batteries for the V2G applications. And we also looked at the levelized cost of electricity. And this is the debt cost, the opportunity cost, and the OM cost. And if we look at the total cost, and this would also cost include the bulk 
uh, bulk fuel cost or the, the cost of the energy to fuel the batteries for the V2G. And this is the cost divided by the uh, electricity used to charge for just the V2G services. Uh, I do want to point out here that you're going to see a pretty low inflation rate. I mean, you're all thinking that's crazy. But I grabbed that from the Congressional Budget Office back in July 2021, and that was their outlook and their forecast, 20 year forecast, which they would have calculated a little bit earlier than that. So if I were to look at the inflation rate right now, it would probably be higher. Should I will look to see what that is. Um, so moving on. So from step one, we have results for the four different services, energy arbitrage, demand charge reduction, frequency regulation, and spinning reserve for the three different fleets. And here, this is just the annual revenues and the annual costs at the bulk level. So this is between Snohomish PUD and Bonneville uh, Power Association. So here we see that the model optimized, they found the largest benefits from energy arbitrage, the demand reduction. So they get the highest net revenues uh, for energy arbitrage than demand charge reduction. And lastly, frequency regulation and spending reserve. And that theme followed through for the vans and the trucks as well, with energy arbitrage having the highest annual revenues and spending reserve and frequency regulation having the least net revenues. But I'd like to point out that this did not include operational costs. So the next thing we take into consideration is the cycling of the battery for these V2G applications and the impact that it had on battery life. So without uh, the V2G, buses normally cycle 191 times annually. Uh, the vans and the trucks cycled a little bit more. But if you look in the bottom box, the driving alone, it, meet, it met the uh, calendar life. Uh, the, the number of cycles didn't exceed the calendar life of the battery. So the battery needs to be replaced in year 13, uh, regardless of just its normal services. So back up to the upper box, if we look at the additional cycling required for the V2G services, it required um, several more hundred, in some cases, cycles per year. And that impacted the overall battery life for the three different fleets for the four different applications. So it reduced the battery life, if you look in the bottom box, in all the instances except for frequency regulation and spinning reserve. So the, the marginal battery life when added to the driving cycles did not exceed the calendar life of the battery. So there was no difference, it did not require an early fleet replacement for um, buses when used for frequency regulation and spinning reserve. And the frequency regulation spinning reserve just had a slightly marginal impact for the vans and trucks on battery life. Well, what is the implication on operational costs or life cycle costs for these fleet owners? Well, here I give two examples. So this is illustrative. And for the bus fleet, I looked at um, an example of arbitrage where the battery life is reduced to nine years. 
And on the bottom box, I looked at using the bus for frequency regulation where there was no impact on um, the battery life. So if we, in the upper box, when used for arbitration, you're reducing the battery life by four years. So the implication is that you're gonna have four, uh, four years of lost interest on that alternative investment that you potentially could have made. And you also have four additional years of debt cost on the loan. And then you also have the operating cost, uh, additional V2G operating costs. And so in this instance, we see that 42% of these costs are associated with just the debt cost on early fleet replacement. Whereas below, when it's used for frequency regulation, there is no early uh, debt cost associated with the loan, nor no lost interest on this other principal, this other investment that you could have made. So 100% of the debt now is just going to operating the um, batteries for its primary purpose. Or sorry, it, uh, it's just the additional costs associated with the V2G purposes on top of its primary driving purposes. So as you can see, it has a, uh, the battery life has a big, um, decor causes a big decrement on the um, battery life and it has large implications on costs for the fleet owner. So uh, continuing with the results here, we're looking at the, um, just the cost of the fleet owner, as I mentioned. So this is, as we can see, because of the large cycling and the additional um, battery degradation, the loan costs, because of all the cycling, the fleet owner is going to incur a lot of cost associated with the arbitrage and the demand charge reduction. And when we look at the levelized cost, it's roughly 23 cents and 13 cents for these. Now, if we just look at frequency regulation and spinning reserve, uh, because there's no early replacement, the the cost of the V2G is much, much lower. And also we are just looking at the operational costs here. We did not include the cost, the retail cost to purchase the electricity. That's a known. Here we're trying to solve the unknown, which is what, is, what are the operational costs? So just from the operational perspective, it's less than a cent per kWh. Um, this follows through with trucks and vans as well the highest cost, present value costs are associated with the arbitrage, then demand charge reduction, and then the frequency regulation and spinning reserve are last because it had um, much lower marginal, marginal operating costs because of the fewer cycles, as well as uh, minimal replacement costs. And lastly, here we're looking at the overall cost. So this is including the marginal revenues that the utilities get from selling their power either through arbitrage or selling it again for uh, any spinning reserve revenues, as well as the reduction in their demand charges and the reduction in their frequency regulation charges. So if we add that into the operating costs or the, the costs that the fleet incorporates, it's reducing the arbitrage and demand charge reductions, but it's still overwhelmingly uh, the largest loss. So the, they're in parentheses because they're all negative. Because of the cycling, the biggest losses are still going to be incurred with arbitrage and demand charge. And the um, overall levelized cost of electricity does fall here a little bit. The same pattern 
um, follows through for the trucks and vans as well, that the highest losses are associated with the arbitrage and demand charge reduction. And the net or total costs associated with the spinning reserve and frequency reserve are much lower. So here are some economic considerations. As you can see, the number of cycles drives the early replacement costs. And it is, if you do replace early, it is the largest part of the overall cost. So arbitrage followed by demand charge consistently has the highest number of cycles and the highest corresponding costs. Whereas frequency regulation and spinning reserve have the lowest cycles and the lowest costs. Uh, the replacement cost technology. Uh, so when I did this, we assumed that the replacement cost was the cost of the vehicle. At the time that we did this, we did not know of a lower cost to just replace the battery, just replace the battery packs. I have spent since spoken with Flow Batteries, and they think that the uh, cost to replace the battery for a bus is somewhere around $100,000, which is a fourth of the battery replacement cost that I was assuming. So if you take that into consideration, the economics will look much more favorable. It's just that the um, there hasn't been a, a lot of battery replacement at this point, so those numbers still need to be firmed up. And then, as I mentioned, uh, this is applicable, the study is applicable nationally. You just need to use the different market prices from the different regions. And then lastly, uh, there are additional research questions. So we let the model optimized based on the market forces. In step one, the, the model choose arbitrage and demand charge reduction because that's where it got the greatest benefit. Well, per kilowatt, we could still look at arbitrage and demand charge reduction because it gets the greatest marginal benefit per kilowatt for those two services. But we could limit the cycling so that it doesn't exceed that battery degradation threshold that will limit the battery life. So if we did that, then arbitrage and demand charge reduction may provide the greatest value. We, we did not limit the cycling in this study, but we would like to do that in the next study. Um, Let's see here. Uh, you know, we do need to firm up the data here. We, even though um, Snohomish has the bilater uh, bilateral agreement with Seattle City Light, we just used prices from the BPA database so we could uh, firm that up a bit. And then, of course, the cost associated with battery replacement. That definitely needs to be firmed up because I think we are overcharging on the cost side. Um, and then we could look at these other applications. Um, we focused our applications according to what Snohomish PUD prioritized, but we could look at uh, resilience applications. We could look at supply supply side or capacity. Uh, reserve, mar reserve margin applications uh, and other applications such as that. Um, another thing we need to look at is uh, the supply side infrastructure and charging equipment. Uh, right now we have to assume uh, one charger is charging one vehicle at any given time, but could you have charging infrastructure that's connected to multiple vehicles so that you could better 
optimize the vehicle to grid so that you know the, the charger could be acting you know on the second um, you know they're at a very granular high resolution level to improve the flow you know the bidirectional flow of energy so that's other considerations so thank you very much uh, i know this is a lot so you know, i encourage questions i would like to uh, give a special thanks to jeremy twitchell he is our uh, the head of our regulatory and battery group who uh, funded this project and he in return gets funding from Imre Kirk from the DOE. So I'd like to thank these two people. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm going to stop sharing and then field any questions that you may have. Hey, Christine. Yeah, thank you very much for the presentation. Uh, I would encourage if anyone's got any additional um, questions to put those in the chat. We have had some come in, and I don't know if it would be easier to share your uh, slide deck. We had a few questions. I think you answered it about slide 12, uh, where, you, where you showed the decreased lifetime coming through. And I think you answered it that, that the assumption there was you were replacing the entire bus or fleet vehicle at that time. And just to clarify, I think you said that you've got some later information that replacing the battery pack would be a fourth of what it would be to replace the entire vehicle. That's that's not a firm number. Yeah. Uh, but that's one of the quotes that's that's coming in. There just hasn't been a lot of battery pack replacement again at the time that we did this um they said it you know it wasn't couldn't be done or couldn't be done cost effectively um so my assumptions sorry just kind of flowing through to show you what i assumed for the fleet cost yeah down here on the right is what i assumed for the just the equity portion Okay. of the fleet replacement costs. And here I assumed 80, 20, 80% 80 equity and 20% loan. But I, I did start running the numbers, assuming a, yeah, a fourth. And in some instances, uh, the results did come out positive. Okay. And when you were doing that analysis that, you know, using those fleet vehicles in for grid applications would decrease the uh, the lifetime. Do you know what chemistry that was there a specific chemistry you were looking at? Yeah, we looked at N NMC. Okay. That was, uh, and not phosphate. That's kind of the industry standard for medium heavy duty at this point. Okay. And then we had a few more questions come in about slide 16. You know, you were giving the example there of um, the cycles. And so how many cycles without the vehicle to grid? And then you have utilizing it in energy arbitrage and the cycles increase. Are those cycles equivalent? So if, if we take the battery from a 90% state of charge to 10% in without a V2G, do we have that same depth of discharge for arbitrage or frequency regulation? Or is, I guess, what's the consistency there? Is it energy throughput? It, it, so it, it was energy, I think it was a combination of both, uh, to be honest. So the frequency regulation and spinning reserve had a lower depth of discharge which resulted in what we're calling lower cycling. And um, I will get the exact verbiage from you and put it in the chat after. I'm gonna to speak to the engineer about this. But I know when we first did it, uh, we didn't fully take depth of discharge into account and we were over decrementing the number of cycles. So the big reason why the frequency regulation spinning reserve has the lower number of cycles because it wasn't, it, it didn't have as much of a depth of discharge. So it didn't hurt the battery as much. 
Okay. So, and then another question that came up was looking at, uh, I don't remember what slide it was, but you were showing the uh, potential cost to the fleet uh, owner for the different services. Um, you know, as we went from buses, and I think it may be the next slide or so, um, as we went from buses seemed to have the lowest cost to the fleet. And then yes. Trucks and vans, or vans and trucks, uh, were much higher, especially in several of those. The reasoning for that? Well, again, it has to do with the cycling, and part of the reason is, is we, you know, we use that fleet DNA database. Is that the buses simply weren't, uh, didn't quite have the flexibility that some of the other uh, fleets had. So and that impacted the number of cycles. So see, the bus has a lower number of cycles across the board compared to the vans and the trucks. So it just had to do when the battery was available. Okay. So you're, you're fixed at 50 vehicles each for the analysis. So. When you're looking at a bus, you've got a much larger energy capacity because those battery packs are larger. Yes. Okay. So in some cases, you may be trying to pull more energy out of the, for the grid service out of a, a van or a truck than you would what you're taking from a bus at that. Correct. Okay. That helps. Um, so we did have a question again. How was the reduction in battery lifetime determined? Was that from the models and? Um... Yes, so we assumed uh, roughly a half percent degradation per year over the life of the battery. And then any additional degradation occurring from the additional cycling. Okay. So and just I the didn't have it. Oh, go ahead. Sorry, just the chemistry itself. There's like a natural degradation rate, and then just the normal usage plus the uh, B2G cycling at the marginal impact on the battery life. Okay. And I do know uh, you, you mentioned that uh, Charlie and uh, Vish were part of this team and both of them have been integral to what we our reliability test lab that we have here at PNNL. And so we we've had you know lithium iron phosphate NMC uh, systems or cells modules and systems on test for a number of years. So I think in the most cases we do have pretty pretty good uh, degradation models on there. We typically do test ours under a fast response frequency regulation duty cycle and then more of an energy intensive peak shaving uh, duty cycle. So I think that, you know, that those numbers are probably being helped informed by what we're getting out of the reliability test lab also. Yes, Vish came up with the formula based on state of charge, uh, okay. number of cycles, chemistry and size for these batteries. So as you mentioned that this is, what you've done is exportable to other parts. So if someone wanted to go into another part of the country, you could you could look at this also. I mean, what what's the primary information that you need though to be to make this transportable? Um, what to make this more fleet utility specific? What what is the use of the fleet? The size of the fleet, and then. Um, what market are you interacting in? So you can get the correct market prices. And then uh, also retail rates that the uh, fleet owner would incur. So here we were just focusing on the operational aspect of it. But if you really wanted to look at net cost, what the fleet owners would have to get in order for V2G to be profitable or to be viable, economically viable to break even, it would have to be the cost of the electricity plus 
the operational cost. Do you think it's possible looking ahead that we're seeing a lot of interest from fleet owners to start looking at second life applications? So as they have a fleet of buses and they take those out of service when they've reached 80% of their original capacity, there still may be enough life in those to do grid services with them. And so people are looking at, you know, could they put those at an electrified bus terminal so you could reduce demand charges? Could that be worked into this payback? Oh. Considering those second life applications? A absolutely. And we talked about secondary microgrid application for the batteries. Yeah, there's, you know, for reliability purposes and standards, especially for a bus, they have to have, maintain a minimum state of charge at all times. For safety reasons, they would have to replace their fleet, but, you know, there's less critical applications that the batteries could certainly be used for and we could study. Absolutely. Okay, let me do one quick search here and see if we've got any other questions. I think we got over most of them. Any closing comments that you want to add? I really appreciate your presentation today. And no, I'm just very happy to present. And again, if I didn't field questions now, I will try and circle back to make sure I answer those questions correctly. Okay. Thank you. So, Laura, I guess we do have one that came in for you. Uh, when will the recording be available? They usually post about a week after. Um, it takes a while to brand them and process them, but they're, they're going to go on a, a website that I'll put the address in the chat box after um, we talk about next the next session. Okay. So, yeah, that would be good. And, and again, it uh, Christina had put her email out there. I think you can go to the PMNL website and search for any of us and get our contact information uh, out there or just reply back into where you registered also and, and be able to connect with us. So um, I do want to highlight our upcoming webinar. So on September 8th, uh, Mark Willey uh, will be talking about the challenges of supporting the U.S. energy storage industry, uh, especially in terms of lithium ion batteries. Um, on September uh, 22nd, uh, Emily uh, Saldana will be talking about machine learning for energy storage. And then um, on October 6th, uh, Kendall Mongard and Vish Vishwanathan will be talking about the soon to be released 2022 energy storage cost and performance uh, assessment. And so please join us for those. Uh, you'll see the registration links uh, on the webpage where you found this one. And uh, we look forward to talking with you again, uh, September 8th. Thank you everyone for your time. And uh, we'll talk to you in a couple of weeks. Thank you.